Good morning, members. We have already formed a quorum. It is also time to start the meeting. This is the meeting of the panel on environmental affairs. First of all, let's confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 23rd of March 2015. So far, we haven't received any proposed amendments. So, minutes confirmed. Any objection? No, thanks. Information papers issued since the last meeting, two have been received. First, to respond to the letter dated uh, 25th of March 2015 from Dr. Kenneth Chen regarding the review of the implementation of the extension of the plastic shopping bag charging to all retail outlets. The second one is a referral arising from the meeting between LegCo members and Kuntan District Council members regarding the retrofitting of noise barriers at the entrance on Kowloon East side of the Eastern Harbour Crossing. So please note the two information papers. Certainly items for discussion at the next meeting. So please take a look of the list of follow-up actions and the list of outstanding items for discussion. At this juncture, I would like to invite the administration to join us. Um, for our next meeting, it will be held on the 22nd of June, a Monday. We have quite a large number of um, items, so I would like to advance the meeting to the uh, to 2 p.m. instead of 2.30. We'd like to tackle three items. First of all, energy saving plan for Hong Kong 2015 to 2025. Second, control of marine pollution from oil spillage, marine littering, and floating refuse. Thirdly, waste diversion plan for the Southeast New Territories landfill. So three items for that meeting. Any objection? Yes, sit hold. Chairman, I do not object. I just want to add one more item. I do understand that we are going to talk about the endangered species. We've received a letter from Greenpeace, and we are told that the fish moles of some endangered species or species have to be protected um, are on sale in Hong Kong. So why don't we sort of uh, talk about this as well? Because we're surprised to find that this is on sale at all. And then air pollution. For the past few years, a lot has been done by the government to tackle pollution arising from vehicles and vessels, like replacement of the vehicular fleet. But then there's a problem with taking the readings, and uh, we need to find out whether it has been cost effective. And recently, there was a uh, civic organization, and then uh, it was said that um, when a a monitoring device was attached to a, um, a tram. The readings uh, obtained were very different from those uh, from the roadside monitoring stations, uh, which were two to three stories tall. So I think we need to have a more detailed discussion about um, the cost effectiveness of different uh, um, mitigation measures against air pollution. Well, regarding um, fish moles, um, of a particular kind of fish, I think we are going to tackle the issue of conservation. Of course, members have referred to um, ivory tucks as well as um, the um, incense wood. So perhaps we should also look at that question as well. And then air pollution. I think towards the end of the year, we are expecting a report on AQOs. Uh, so perhaps uh, we can discuss that matter as well. Or perhaps Mr. Wong, the Secretary for the Environment, can advise us. Mr. Chairman, yes, um, I think it's more focused to uh, deal with a number of issues at a single meeting. Ms. Ho, maybe that can be taken forward in this way. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to put forward a number of questions. Uh, there's still some time between now and the end of the year meetings, so perhaps I can drop a list of issues. Yes, please uh, give me your papers for referral to the Secretary for the Environment so that he can be more focused in his response at our next meeting. 
All right. Without further ado, we can deal with the fourth item on the agenda, which is provision of onshore power supply at Kai Tech Cruise Terminal. I'll give the floor to the administration to walk us through the paper, and then I'll open the floor to members for questions. I think we are all familiar with the public officers in, atten uh, in attendance. Mr. Wong, Secretary for the Environment. Thank you. I would like to thank the panel on environmental affairs for giving us time to talk about the provision of onshore power supply at Kaja Cruise Terminal. I will highlight the main points, and then myself and my colleagues will uh, receive uh, will, uh, Answer questions from you. According to the findings of the study of the consultant engaged by the government, technically speaking, it is feasible to have onshore power supply. According to April 2014 prices, the whole system will cost us about $350 million as to the annual recurrent cost, including maintenance and operation, is estimated to be around $14 million. It is a capital item, and we need a detailed design. We need to um, uh, apply for funding. To avoid clashing with berthing of the visiting cruises, the whole op installation process may take up a bit more time, and we believe that it may take up to about 60 months. There's also the question of the assessment of the market demand. Um, the EPD, as well as the consultant, has found out that currently, Globally, there are only about 32 international cruises using OPS, accounting for 16% of the total. Most of such OPS-capable cruises operate in routes in New North America. For the cruise schedule of Kaita Cruise Terminal in year 2015, um, there are 56 cruise calls, but about only six calls would be made by OPS capable cruises, about 10% of the total calls scheduled. Currently in Asia, we haven't got any cruise terminals uh, which have got OPS. Therefore, it is difficult to expect the uh, cruise liners to deploy um, OPS capable cruises to come to the Asia Pacific region. There's also a new trend. That is more and more cruises are equipped with scrubbers and alternative technology for emission reduction. This means that um, they are not going to breach the latest sulfur limit requirement of the emission control areas in North America and Europe, and at the same time, they can save fuel costs. According to the information announced, at least 60% of the cruises will be equipped or retrofitted with the scrubbers. In this way, uh, it means that it will lower the interest of the companies retrofitting their um, cruises with the OPS systems, and also terminals will be less interested in having the OPS. Now, having OPS means that we can reduce the uh, emission at the time of birthing, but then the findings of the study are such that uh, if we are to install the OPS at the Kaito Cruise Terminal in the foreseeable future, we can see that there will be a very serious matter of underutilization. This is because only a small number of cruise vessels can use OPS. Most of them are operating in North America. Most cruise liners now prefer to add scrubbers for reducing their emissions. It is unlikely that OPS will become the technology of choice. OPS systems are also costly to install. Moreover, cruise terminals I mean, uh, cruise liners are not too interested in having the OPS capability. Moreover, for Hong Kong to use OPS, it could be more costly to use than low sulfur fuel, and therefore OPS-capable cruises visiting Hong Kong would likely prefer 
to continue with the mandatory requirement of switching to low sulfur fuel, which will take effect on the 1st of July 2015, instead of opting to use OPS. Having regard to the above considerations, we recommend to keep a close monitoring on developments internationally on installation of OPS capable systems in cruises for a time being. As and when there is a rising trend of installation of OPS capable systems in cruises, we would review whether it is appropriate to take forward the installation of OPS in Kaita Cruise Terminal and seek members' views. Moreover, uh, for the uh, switch of fuel, which will take effect on the 1st of July 2015, um, it will significantly improve the situation. Say, for example, for the mandatory switch, it means that um, for the sulfur dioxide emission as well as the PM emission, it has um, resulted in a reduction of 70 percent. So we believe that uh, with such we can achieve the emission reduction target. So members with questions, please raise your hands. So far we've got Lo Wai Kwok, Kenneth Chen, Chen Bang, Zit Ho. Each will have well adequate time, five minutes. First one is Loi Kwok. Thank you, Chairman. Of course, provider OPS for cruises. Well, it's not just our subjective wish alone. You have to look at the market situation as well. If the information from the survey is accurate, that is now in the market. Uh, cruises using OPS make a very low proportion. If that's the case, then we need to consider when we should install the OPS units. But the paper shows us that this will be the trend anyway. Paragraph 13 says that in the Asia Pacific, about 60. Um, Cruise terminals altogether, and about uh, uh, five ports are considering provision of OPS in the coming five to ten years. So, looking to the future, OPS is something that uh, is a trend that is worth noting. Well, let's be pragmatic. Looking at the data, we do hope that, of course, uh, reducing emissions by OPS may not be the most effective. Due to market factors, I agree. But I'm also concerned that you know, when it comes to OPS, it's not just about large cruises. You know, all the um, vessels at birth in Hong Kong, many of them are local vessels. Shouldn't you know, we consider? Uh, using OPS for these vessels, whether it's physical, uh, you know, technically feasible, technically. Well, maybe you've done some preliminary study already. But it's obvious that if it's feasible technically, and uh, if we can provide the support needed, then this will help reduce emissions from these vessels. I also believe that for users. This will be convenient to them because even small vessels, once they're at birth, you know, if they have to um, um, switch on the uh, generator to um, produce electricity, then that's very non environmental friendly. Have you done any preliminary study on that? So I'll give you time, uh, the Secretary, to answer. Secretary, please. Thank you, Mr. Lowe. And my colleagues can supplement later. I agree with Mr. Lowe that we need to um, be prepared on in both hands. We need to notice the development in Asia Pacific region in the short run. In Hong Kong, actually, there's limit. We have doubts about the uh, if benefits of applying OPS in Hong Kong. Um, but in Hong Kong, what we can do is recently, the Hong Kong government has its own designed and con 
straight um, constructed uh, vessel that transport um, mud or sludge. Okay, from one station to another, from one place to another. So this is a vessel um, constructed by Hong Kong government, and it uses OPS. So the Hong Kong government is setting an example. Supplement? Yes. Um, on which vessel to use OPS? Which vessels would be best suited for using OPS? Well, it's for vessels that are berth for a long time because then the unit can really reduce its emissions because it doesn't have to use its own power generators. But looking at the vessels in Hong Kong, you know, we just uh, talk about cruises. But how about container, uh, you know, vessels? Well, they are berth for a long time normally, and they use a lot, of, a large number of view. So from July first. They will be uh, required to switch to no sulfur fuel. But how about OPS? Looking at um, countries worldwide, um, there is this market situation still that very few, you know, container ships are equipped with OPS units. Very few container ports have OPS, you know, facilities available for them. So let me give you a bit more uh, background information. The the worldwide trend now is, you know, IMO. This organization has a plan to by 2020. They plan to by then use a, a with few that it has a sulfur content 3.5. They want to reduce the percentage to 0 0.5. That's a big change. But in the maritime industry, it, it, that's something that people are considering. Being planned for dropping from 3.5 to 0.5 means that you will have to use a different kind of fuel, like diesel fuel. You know, the pr there's a big price difference there too. Therefore, ship companies are actively thinking where they can use the scrubbers to, on the one hand, reduce the issue of emissions, and and on the other hand, um, reduce the costs. So you can see that. You can see from the paper that for cruises, the top one or two cruise companies have announced that they would install scrubbers on most of their cruises. If scrubbers would be the trend, then you can see that in the future, OPS would not be used as much in the future. Even it will be used even less in the future. Kenneth Chen, CP Party. In response to the government's new stance, that is to shelf um, installing OPS facilities at KTCT, we'd like to express our grave disappointment. You know, this plan just ended or went nowhere, and we're very angry with the government's sudden change of stance as well. I don't even understand why. Back in uh, 2013, the policy addressed, and I'm sure the secretary was well aware of that. Paragraph 140, Chief Executive Lan Chen Ying told us, to Lachko, right before us, let me quote him, that the KTCT, the first Perth, will be um, in operation in the middle of 2013. We plan to apply for funding from Lachko to install OPS units to uh, provide a service to cruisers with the equipment to um, reduce emissions when they are at birth. In the secretary, in January 2013, Christine Lowe, Deputy Secretary, uh, reiterated that within that year, they would apply for funding from LegCo, and she said they would not expect uh, much uh, controversies. And it would take time, she said, to for perhaps a few years before the OPS facilities will be in operation. So 2013, you know, that's two and a half years ago. Now, if the government saying to us that uh, he would um, live up to his pledge. Back in 2020, he, they had told us that they would prepare the space or reserve the space for um, the OPS and also study the uh, international standards to enhance air quality at our port and also to protect public health, to reduce early death caused by air pollution and to cut down on our medical expenses. And they also said that it would actually um, helped indeed 
um, Mekong Kong a pioneer in um, reducing the air pollution in the peripheral delta. But what's happened is uh, Lan Chen Ying has gone back on his promise, and Secretary Wong Kam Singh told us that uh, this piece, special piece of OPS, will be missing from the entire puzzle. So the whole thing seems uh, quite, you know, hard to understand for me. And we haven't got adequate explanation either. If the government is looking at it from the perspective of the public, then, you know, KTCT has a revenue of uh, more than $2 billion. And now we're talking about an investment of uh, a little more than $3 million to install OPS. You know, we've got some, and yet the government allows for the going ahead of infrastructure projects that cost billions of dollars, hundreds, of, tens of billions of dollars. And now the government is so calculating, you know, when it comes to this, um, you know, um, system to, en to enhance air quality, while the government turns a blind eye to wasting a lot more money for infrastructural projects. So the announcement today is very is something that I can't accept. I like to ask the government to retract its decision and to put the OPS OPS something that you promised us in your policy address in 2013 back on the agenda. You also owe the public an explanation on your latest decision, Secretary. Um, Chen, I do not agree with Mr. Chen. The government is tackling the issue of air quality very seriously. Look at, you know, in Asia and other parts of the world, which country has, in such a short period of time, um, de devoted so much resources and come up with so many rules to improve air quality? Last year, we had a new regulation governing the fuel used on vessels. Next year, on July, uh, next month, on July 1st, we have a new regulation making Hong Kong the first port in Asia requiring switching to those of a few. And after the new regulation comes into effect, the uh, emittance, you know, uh, sulfur dioxide particulars will be uh, reduced largely by 70 percent. So that ties in with our goal to improve air quality. From the switching to those of a few, and uh, the and other measures, etc. So that would help reduce uh, or enhance air quality to a large extent. We're talking about a, a reduction of pollutants of seventy percent. We also use various means through various sorts of coordinations to make improvements. So we are trying to reach our goal. The secretary is unapologetic at all, and he's just sticking to his decision. Next one is uh, Chen Han Pan. You know, uh, when we asked um, drivers to switch off engines, um, you know, that's an, one measure to improve air quality. But when a um, vessel is at birth, should we ask them to switch off the engine as well? In Hong Kong, according to the paper, um, sulfur dioxide emissions make up 40% of the pollution at sea in Hong Kong. So this 40% emissions, of course, will not come from KTCT, but from the container um, terminals. But all along, ever since we raised the issue till now, has the government considered residents in Meifu, Kuaichung, Chinwan have been subject to the um, emissions for so long, and yet the government has not made any mention of that. Of course, I would not object to the installation of OPS at the KTCT. Yet, if we think that installing OPS at KTCT is one way to enhance air quality, that's only a very small step. Container terminal is instead the main source of air pollution here. Even though the government says that you've launched various mission, uh, very measures like switching to loads of a few. But don't forget that the vessels will still have the engines on, despite the new regulation. There are the sources like dust or carbon dioxide, other types of pollutants that are uh, emitted still, even though the sulfur content will be reduced. The government says that there is now a new technology, uh, namely scrubbers. 
you know, that have been used for two years by vessels or cruises. Secretary, well, if you keep just waiting, later on, vessels may use solar energy or other sources of uh, electricity. You may have to wait 30, 30, 20, 30 years. All we know is that when, you know, there's a, a cruise uh, coming, to the KT city, then people living in the Kowloon, Kowloon, uh, Kowloon would be subjected to pollution. And the paper also says that in various places worldwide, not many terminals have uh, OPS. Even in a in, in the Kowloon port, indeed, in China also has uh, OPS. Kaohsiung also has uh, OPS. Alaska, the port in Alaska, uh, in LA and Sweden also have OPS. So I don't understand why Hong Kong, as a leading busy port in Hong Kong, why are we allowing cruises and container ships to uh, emit all sorts of pollutants, and yet we're not installing OPS? I don't think Hong Kong government or Hong Kong people would mind spending the um, $3 million to improve air quality. So, Mr. Wong, Secretary, when are you going to start considering the provision of OPS? And then for the Kai Tak Cruise Terminal, please don't halt the plan. It's meaningless to wait for uh, the new technologies because new technologies will crop up all the time, Mr. Mock. When we talk about onshore power supply, it doesn't mean that uh, we, the government, provide the OPS facilities at the dock side and then it will work. An even more important factor is for the ocean going vessels to be equipped uh, with OPS capability and then they will be able to use OPS. For the government to take unilateral action to provide OPS, and if the ocean-going vessels do not have OPS, then we cannot achieve the target of air pollution control. And then our facilities, we've even when built, will just not be used. So the key to the question is whether the ocean-going vessels are going to adopt uh, OPS as a trend. That's the key to the issue. Now, we can see that among our vessels, or OGVs in particular, um, most of the um, vessels using OPS would mainly be cruises. But still, for international cruises equipped with OPS, um, the ratio is still about 10% or so, as indicated in the paper. For vessels calling at the container terminal, the percentage is even lower. Mr. Chairman, I hope you can give us more time to answer this question. In fact, we very much hope to resort to more measures to reduce the pollution caused by vessels calling at the container terminal uh, at the uh, seaside for on the seaside residence now we have resorted to the switch to marine fuel of sulfur uh, of a lower sulfur content we believe that it will work sit home for the switch of fuel above this is exactly why towards the end of the year I would like to have a follow up on pollution measures. We have enacted so many rules and regulations. We spent so much money. We want to measure the cost effectiveness. Here in this paper, the government tried to rebut the argument by putting forward percentages. I don't think this is going to work for the Kai Tak Cruise Terminal. I think the utilization rate is low. Assuming that the Kaita Cruise Terminal is being used at full capacity, even if we are only able to reduce 60% or another percentage of the air pollution, but then the pollutants in abstract terms will still be significant. Now, it is said that uh, in the medium term, the OGVs will be using scrubbers. 
and when they birth, uh, we'll ask them to switch the field. Maybe as a last resort, um, uh, OPS will still be indispensable. And in any event, um, you have already um, set aside sufficient space at the KTCT for the equipment. So please give us the abstract figures, and then we know about the true picture. Please don't just give us a percentage. If you talk about 60%, uh, say for Kalu East, in the past we didn't have the cruises at birth. Nowadays we may have ten percent, uh, a ten percent utilization. But still, the amount of pollutants will have been increased. So please, uh, in the future, give us the absolute figures instead of giving us the percentages only. For paragraph thirteen, it is said that. Five um, ports in the Asia Pacific region are considering the provision of OPS. Where are they? We have always claimed ourselves to be the uh, pacemaker, pace setter of air pollution control measures. So I want to know whether we have our own direction of policies. Do we still want to remain as the leader in this regard, or should we wait for even third world ports to have? Got OPS before we follow suit. I think we can move faster. Five other ports are considering the provision of OPS, so I think it's but right for us to take the lead. Um, for pollution at the container terminal, would you just um, rely on the switch of fuel at birth or whether? You just rely on um, scrubbers being used. Are you going to uh, adopt other measures so as to reduce the impact of air pollution? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with Mr. Ho. That is in future in relevant papers. Uh, while we give the uh, percentages, we should also provide the absolute figures. I welcome such a suggestion so that we can have um, clearer data for the sake of transparency. And then, when it comes to air pollution control, we want to take the lead. We want to be effective. I think we want to have both elements. A Hong Kong is the first place in Asia to mandate a switch of fuel at birth, and it is going to be effective. And then for the vessel carrying the sludge, every day we have got uh, the sludge being sent from the Kwai Chung Terminal to our uh, treatment facility. It is our own initiative. Currently, um, if we think that the provision of the facility would only result in a very small degree of cost effectiveness, then we need to reconsider the case. Mr. Mark, for the case of OPS, it is not that we are going to shelve it altogether. What we are recommending here is that we'll keep in view, we will monitor the development of OPS, we want to find out whether there will be more and more cruises or vessels using OPS. If that is the case, then we will reconsider the matter. Just now, Ms. Sit Ho asked which five Asian ports are considering the provision of OPS. Well, when we made the inquiries, we said that it was for the purpose of internal reference, so it may not be appropriate for us to disclose which five ports. One of them would be Ocean Terminal in Hong Kong. In the past, we did ask them, and we have also mentioned this to members. We have been told by the Ocean Terminal operator that they have been considering the provision of OPS. Our understanding is that they are still considering whether it is feasible. Next, Mr. Wu Chiwai. Just a simple point. In Hong Kong, the cruise liners have said that they would like to adopt Hong Kong as the home port when they do their scheduling. Of course, we know that if we build the OPS facility and yet we haven't got OPS capable vessels calling our ports, then it will be useless. Now, if the cruise 
foreigners would like to adopt Hong Kong as the home port, then maybe um, their negotiation with the Hong Kong government will provide an opportunity. Perhaps you should talk to the cruise liners to ask them to make sure that when they schedule uh, the cruise calls, um, they should um, help us to make a breakthrough. Currently, uh, the OPS capable uh, cruises uh, deployed to North America instead of coming to Asia Pacific. I'm afraid it will become a vicious cycle. Perhaps the Secretary for the Environment can explain more to our citizens. Other than the um, cost, I want to know whether using onshore power supply would also reduce the cost on the part of the um, vessel companies. Uh, of course, they have to spend money on the facility, but uh, will there be a reduction in the cost if, on the other hand, if it is a clear case that there will be an increase in the cost, then of course they won't be interested to provide the relevant uh, equipment. Secretary, first of all, whether adopting Hong Kong as the home port will act as an opportunity. Now, for OPS, it won't be the only choice for uh, cruisers to reduce their pollution. As I have said for the IMO, the IMO is considering the following measure for 2020, that is the sulfur content should be lowered from 3.5% to 0.5%. Um, so for the OGV operators, they can see that uh, when it is to be reduced to 0.5%, then they have to use the um, marine light uh, diesel. And recently, we have seen that they are now using scrubbers on board their vessels. Now, for the two largest uh, cruise liners in the world, they have already announced that most of their cruises will be retrofitted with scrubbers. Now, after they have retrofitted with uh, scrubbers, there will be limited space left for OPS equipment. And with the scrubbers, they are able to meet the air pollution control measures. At the same time, they are able to meet the emission reduction requirements. They can also save a fuel cost. Therefore, we can see that it appears that the trend won't be in the direction of OPS. It appears that they are talking about other emission control measures. So if it is found that uh, using OPS is cheaper, or if it is found that using other means uh, would be cheaper, say, for example, switch off fuel at birth, then we don't see any incentive in terms of cost to attract them to switch over to OPS. Now, say, for example, if we just for the time being disregard the recurrent cost, uh, we still cannot see how they can save costs when they birth. Mr. Wu Chiwai. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the government is duty bound to tell us about the cost of the project, the cost of the operation, and how it compares with the impact of using scrubbers instead. Uh, all the figures should be presented to the public so that the public can make a decision. Otherwise, Now, it is said that the cruise terminal is significantly underutilized. And it is said that maybe the OPS will be underutilized. And then it means that it is not cost effective. We need more data before we can pass a judgment. Now, Secretary, now you are saying that uh, you are going to drop the plan, and it seems that we are giving it up. But what about your previous pledge to the community to have OPS? Colleagues, I think you have all received a copy uh, of the motion 
um, from Dr. Kenneth Chen. I will give members time to ask questions first before I move on to Dr. Chen's um, draft motion. Well, for the policy address pledge made by the CG, I think it was made out of good intention. The policy address pledge has been mentioned in Dr. Chen's uh, draft motion. Now, for the cruise industry, um, usually when they have new cruises, um, they will be deployed to North America and then they will be retired from that market and then they will come to Asia Pacific region. Uh, for the scrubbers, I think it is a feasible system. Mr. Chairman, I think you know, uh, sorry, Mr. Uh, Secretary, you know that for us, the staff area, we, has already, we have already used it, and you can reduce the SO2 uh, re uh, emission by 90%. Uh, I think this is quite similar to the case of the power generation plant. Now, I want to talk about the pollution at the container terminal. It's very serious there. And representing my constituency, you know, we've been actually um, trying very hard frantically to comply with the new measures proposed by the government. Container terminal, you know, switching to another uh, suburb fuel is one way. And uh, terminal operators have invested a lot to and uh, swap you know uh, diesel uh, with a more uh, you know less environmentally uh, or more environmental friendly fuel so there are various measures just then you mentioned the trend of IMO to use scrubbers so i think we should just take a look and see uh, what the results are the advantages of scrubbers uh, are that it, not, it, not, it can suppress the PBM and also SO2. So it's quite a good facility. The companies that have worked for, let me declare, um, you know, here, the, the companies that have worked for will, can, will actually install scrubbers, for example, on the Star Ferry vessels. Secretary, are you going to respond? Thank you, Mr. Yik. Let me reiterate that um, on the one hand, We'll continue to closely monitor you know, measures that can improve air quality, including OPS. Um, you know whether OPS uh, could be installed at the cruise terminal here. We'll take various approaches as well, and to use uh, public money effectively at appropriate times to reduce emission. And also, apart from um, regulating vessels, even for container uh, construction size, you know, on the non-road side, you know, um, other projects will also introduce regulations. We use various ways to improve air quality. Assistant Director, Mr. Mock. Yes, I just want to respond to a point made by uh, Wu Chi Wai earlier. He mentioned uh, whether we could provide them with concrete data, but indeed in a paper it's mentioned that uh, KTCT paragraph 11, it mentioned that in year 2015, uh, there will be 56 cruise calls at the KCT. That is, we're assuming that um, uh, you know only six calls will be made by OPS capable cruises. So, judging from the development so far, it's obvious that for large cruise companies, they are not considering using OPS. That made us feel that we need to reconsider whether you know OPS is popular enough. In the session on way forward in our paper, we propose that. We should closely monitor um, OPS systems at cruise terminals in other places, places in the world. If more cruise terminals are using OPS, then we'll review whether KTCT should provide OPS facilities. Thank you. Next one is Mot Lai Kwong. Chairman, of course, 
you know, um, the government had already promised to install PS, and now it's that's not going to do. I'm very disappointed with that. But I think the issue is, on the one hand, whether you know Chief Executive Liang Chunying just made the promise without thinking carefully, and now professional colleagues in the government department found that you know with the change in technology. You know, with the rise of scrappers and so forth, maybe they are a more cost-effective solution, or maybe another reason is the KTCT itself is just a white elephant. Well, if that's the case, then why, of course, should we uh, mention installing OPS KTCT and not install OPS at container terminals? So, Chairman, my question is: If Hong Kong is to maintain its leading position in uh, port operations or maritime industry. If Hong Kong is to take a lead, would we attract vessels, uh, you know, in Asia to indeed switch to OPS? My other question is: Is it true that after doing the verification study, that KT City is really a white elephant? So the issue is. The number of cruises has just kept, you know, um, reducing. So if there's only one or two cruises coming to the terminal issue, then of course there's no point installing OPS. If that's the case, then secretary, then uh, you are actually at a disadvantage because that the 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 crux of the issue lies, you know, beyond you know this uh, pollution issue. Secretary Wong, let me sh uh, thank you, Mr. Mock. Let me share with you some figures. If you look at the figures this year, there are about six cruisers um, that had uh, OPS uh, capable systems, about 10% of the total calls scheduled for this year. Looking at next year, there will be more cruise calls, about 99 next year. Among them, um, cruises with OPS systems would be seven, so less than 10%. So these is an objective data for you, but more importantly, uh, members ask, "What are the maximum or, or the ultimate benefits?" Well, just then we said through um, ships, meshes on vessels and cars, and um, electricity generators. Those are the uh, you know measures in total that we use to improve air quality, for the sake of public health, secretary. I know what you're trying to say, but Chairman, my question was: Was it that the initial decision to, um, you know, have the OPS was made, you know, without considering that there's so few Asian cruises using OPS? Secretary, I think, in comparison with uh, development in technology, where well, things do keep changing, when we reserve the space. That is when we took the two prompt approach to install OPS at the terminal and also to consider other feasible options. I think that's a reasonable approach. If we had not reserved the space, then should technology be inclined towards this area, then we would not have the chance to use it. So I think it's reasonable for us to reserve space for the technology. Best for when we should implement it, I think we need to take a pragmatic attitude. You know, as you said, I mean, if it's something useless, then there's no point having it. Chairman, I think because of time, I think this really reflects um, the, our administration just uh, make empty promises and giving uh, the public false expectations. Maybe the government itself has not sorted out you know, the whole picture. Is it that we're having fewer crews coming, and you know, technology was uh, you know found to be not that useful in the beginning, and yet you made a decision without careful considerations, and now the public is disappointed. So if KCTC is not really um, operating. Uh, that uh, fruitfully, then maybe we should install the facilities at the container terminals. Can we be a pioneer so that in the region we can uh, take a lead in you know investing money to protect public health, and on the other hand, in the maritime industry, we can be the leader in, in incorporating new technology. We can play the, the role of a pioneer, secretary or assistant director. Yes, I think as I said earlier. Uh, it's not just about 
installing OPS at the terminal, you need to find uh, or have vessels with OPS capable system. We can see that for cruises. Let me supplement here. Just then, Mr. Mock asked, uh, Mr. Mock asked the question. In 2014, back in that year, the large cruise companies announced that most of the cruises will have scrub scrubbers. So that's a recent development. So paragraph 14 states that too. As for container ships, container ships using um, OPS capable systems not even uh, even have a sm the the number even even smaller. So it's not that you have OPS facilities at the terminal, then cruises will install the OPS capable system. Chairman, it, my conclusion is, if that's the case, then the government should not have made a promise in the beginning. Next one is Chen Kimpo. Whether to have APS, well, it involves investment of um, more than $300 million. So you need to look at the worldwide trend first. So it's very obvious that uh, even for cruises with system, they only make up 10% of the total cost. So if you make this proposal to the finance committee, you will only, you know, be uh, actually your proposal will only be voted down by a big margin. So I think it's appropriate now to be to withdraw this proposal. You are not saying that you're not going to, going to do it. You just want to monitor the situation first. It's not that you know you're not going to um, do with it anymore. So sometimes if you push something through, uh, it's not as good as actually looking at the situation more carefully. Looking at the you know current trend, if you install the facility and yet no cruises uh, use it, then there's no point doing it. I think we should just continue to study the issue, and particularly now, particularly scene now, you found that scrubbers seem to be the rising trend. Then, I believe that the uh, the environment team within the administration that you must know more about the situation than us. You would, you know, I think that will be the trend. I hope that you will provide us with a better option later on for our discussion. Secretary, thank you, Mr. Chen, for your view. We are serious with improving air pollution um, by, you know, coming up with all sorts of appropriate measures. We have to look at the trend first and put forward to uh, to you for discussions, uh, you know, on um, the latest trends. As I said, we. Are still prudently considering the OPS and other measures, but as I said, scrubbers are a recent trend that could affect the future development of OPS, and so that are they are among other ways that could help improve air quality. So we must we must move with the times and find the most appropriate or most cost effective measure. You know, we have mentioned in our uh, clean air blueprint that uh, we have our new targets in 2020, and there will be a host of measures to be adopted to reach that target. We need to take a more macro view. That's more appropriate, I think. Okay, no follow-up question. Next one is Priscilla Lam. Thank you, Chairman. I think the Secretary is aware that you know on this uh, cruise terminal in Canon East, Canon West. Vessels at birth in Hong Kong, you know, have produced, um, of course, or contributed to air pollution. I've complained about the air pollution many, many times. As a resident myself, I do hope that New Territories West members are aware of too. Can hear this too. I've complained against um, air pollution many times on Ting Kao in the coast of Ting Kao. I always doing my spot checks. At 6 a.m. and midnight, I can smell the um, you know odor in the air. I've asked the water quality experts, and they told me that that shouldn't be the case. But if I turn out that illegal fuel disposal activities are very common, and um, they playing a um, cat and mouse game with the administration, you know water keeps flowing. But I'm also very clear that, clear that in Kowloon East. 
where there's the KTCT. We had a forum there. You can smell the odor there. So I really like demonstration to to tell us on this. You know, when it comes to OPS, I remember during we had uh, had logical discussions on this issue. Now you're saying that the usage rate of uh, OPS is low, but why? I remember cruise companies had uh, international. They do uh, you know, under international charters to uh, encourage each other, you know, fellow operators to. Use or engage in behavior that result in air and water pollution. So, have you done any publicity at all in terms of legislation? Have you got any plans to more stringently, you know, uh, to help you more stringently enforce the law? Um, are there difficulties? With uh, you know enforcement, law enforcement, or is it difficult for you to carry out spot checks? We have solved. Now the residents are suffering, and yet you are telling us that you haven't detected it. But in fact, we have seen the um, release of uh, fuel illicitly. Now I live in that area. I also serve residents who are suffering. Now we've been told, we've been promised that OPS would be a solution. Now you say that it's not going to work. So can you propose an alternative so as to address our concerns? You can't simply dismiss it just because of the low utilization rate. I don't think this is answerable. I don't think you have responded to our aspirations. In fact, both my constituents and myself are suffering from this kind of pollution. Thank you, uh, Dr. Leung, for your question. Yes, I know you are concerned about air pollu uh, water pollution. I can take up the matter with you on another occasion. Here we are mainly talking about air pollution. Uh, we have already got a blueprint to deal with uh, pollution, and we have got specific measures to deal with vessel emissions. On the 1st of July this year, we are going to implement a new requirement, and we are the first port in Asia to do so. And in fact, this will uh, improve the situation not just in Kowloon East or Kowloon West. In fact, um, um, pollutants arising from uh, or pollutants uh, emitted by vessels will be reduced. We are mandating uh, the switch of uh, fuel. And in fact, um, at high tech for SO2 and RSP emissions, uh, they will be greatly reduced by 70%. So indeed, it is effective. Sorry, uh, just now I asked many questions. You have got a charter, you have got soft tactics, you also encourage the use of less polluting fuels. Uh, if you have a law, what about people who are breaking the law? Have you been enforcing the law vigorously? Um, Mr. Mock, for the switch of fuel, we started with a charter followed by legislation. Well, of course, we enforce the law vigorously, and we've also got officers uh, carrying out uh, police operation. Dr. Leung, if you are interested uh, in the uh, illicit uh, release of fuel, please attend our next meeting in June. We'll discuss that matter on the 22nd of June. Elbert Chen. Now, for the provision of OPS at the cruise terminal, I think it is a legitimate request. Is this something very new so that when it was first designed, uh, this part was missing from the cruise terminal plan? Uh, what about ocean terminal? What about Chim Sa Chui? And what about container terminals in Hong 
our continued trauma rule in Hong Kong. Are we going to get it? Have we got it? I don't think it should be unique to Kai Chak Cruise Terminal because probably the container port is more heavily used. So won't you agree with me that it should be provided at all the terminals? Not just the cruise terminal, but also the China Hong Kong ferry terminal, the Hong Kong Macau ferry terminal as well. For pollution emitted by vessels, we know that it is worse than vehicular emission. Of course, for the time being, let's not include uh, aviation related uh, pollution. I don't think we should single out Kai Tak cruise terminal. What about the case of Hong Kong as a whole? And then for ocean going vessels, now you are mandating the switch of fuel at birth so that the sulfur content should not exceed 0 0.5%. I think we should impose this on all the vessels in our harbor instead of just ocean going vessels at birth because the mainland vessels are also very polluting. When vessels come in, they are belching out black smoke. Not to mention mainland vessels. From time to time, we also see the black smoke being emitted from our local ferries and is polluting our sky seriously. So, Secretary, Secretary, I will answer briefly and then my colleague will supplement. I agree with Mr. Chen that is for um, vessel emission. Uh, yes, it is a source of pollution, and we can't just talk about OPS. And OPS uh, should not be the only solution we are going after. We should adopt a multi-pronged approach. And last year, we enacted uh, a regulation, and that's about the marine light diesel regulation. And this year, we are going to mandate the switch of fuel at birth. And we are the first port in Hong in Asia to do so. So we have been comprehensive in our uh, measures. Assistant Secretary, well, OPS isn't a common facility. Um, among the ocean-going vessels, cruises are relatively um, more sort of um, uh, equipped with um, OPS. Currently, there are just 30 or so OPS-capable cruises, probably towards end of the year, 35 at most, and still just accounting for 16% of the global figures. In Asia, we haven't got any cruise terminals equipped with OPS. And then for the um, marine fuel, in fact, the IMO does have requirements concerning the uh, standards of the marine fuel. Currently, the sulfur content uh, is set at 3.5% or below. For Hong Kong, come next month, we have the switch of fuel at birth. When they are at birth, the sulfur content cannot exceed 0.5%. In this way, we can greatly reduce the emission of SO2 and RSP by up to 70 or even 80%. In other words, we can see that um, in this way, we can reduce the emission from vessels. As to the belching or black smoke, from vessels. Marine Department is currently enforcing the law against this matter. No, my questions haven't been answered. When I put my questions, I knew that 0.5% uh, being the sulfur content limit for ocean going vessels at birth. So you're simply repeating my question. My question was the limit should be imposed on all vessels in our harbor. So you're wasting our time. You haven't listened carefully. So it's quite uh, pointless to have meetings with the public officers. They just uh, repeat what we have um, said. 
can you give them another minute to answer my question? Otherwise, it's a waste of time. Secretary, please teach your uh, colleagues as to how to answer members' questions. Um, Albert, uh, order, please. Mr. Chong, I want to know whether we have got an increasing number of ports using OPS. Does it mean if the answer is in the negative, does it mean that it has been given up as a solution? If the answer is in the positive, what is the rate of increase? If they are moving quickly, then of course we need to work on our OPS. If not, if there is an alternative technology or new technologies being developed, I also agree that we should pause and think. We have just got too many white elephants. Even if you build the OPS facility, you will just be attracting criticisms. So please think carefully and maybe put it on hold for the time being. So my question is, what is the trend? And secondly, for the switch of fuel, does it apply to all vessels? And what about warships, military vessels, when they call Hong Kong? Uh, they being uh, sort of um, controlled as well. So, uh, Mr. Mock, for the trend, it is exactly that in the year 2014, the two largest cruise liners, you have already talked about this. Because of this, this news told us that even for such large cruise liners, they are using scrubbers. Once they have adopted scrubbers, they won't use OPS because space available on a vessel will be limited. So this incident tells us that the trend is such that they are opting for something else than OPS. For the switch of fuel, for military vessels throughout the world, they are exempted. So they won't be uh, regulated by such laws. If I may ask this question, you have said that it seems that the companies are dominating. But what about North American terminals? They have got OPS. Would it be a, a waste of money? I think we can also take the initiative if you talk to the other governments, if they have also adopted such a uh, policy direction, can we not sort of take the initiative or uh, must you uh, be led by the nose uh, by such uh, companies? AD. Well, let me talk about the provision of OPS for international cruises. Currently, the terminals with OPS are all found in North America. In Europe, there's only one terminal for international cruises to use OPS. In Asia, we haven't got any at all. So in terms of international cruises, uh, it is not a technology that is in common use. And therefore, when there are cruise liners making announcements saying that they are going to use scrubbers. It means that the market is such that um, we cannot expect increasing use of OPS among the cruises. You wondered whether the government can change the trend on its own. Now, Hong Kong is but one of the many ports called by the international cruises, one of the many in Asia. So if we provide OPS for us to try to change uh, the trend and urge them to use OPS, I don't think it is going to have any significant uh, effect. Mr. Chen Hanpeng and Ms. Sit Ho, are you going to ask a question? No? Uh, Albert Chen as well. Two minutes each. And then Dr. Priscilla Leung, two minutes each, and then I will deal with the motion uh, suggested by Dr. Chen. Mr. Chen, uh, it's a chicken and egg issue. In Hong Kong, we haven't got OPS. Therefore, OPS capable vessels don't have to call the port of Hong Kong, so they would just go to OPS uh, 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 terminals. In Hong Kong, we do provide a concession for the 
switch of fuel. Even at Kwai Chong, we haven't got any concessions. So even though we have a small scale OPS, it is not commonly used. In Hong Kong, you are encouraged to opt for electric cars because when you recharge, it is free. I hope the government won't give up the idea so early. Um, we are in the new territories west, and we want to know from the government the plan to improve air quality near Kwai Chung Terminal. Would OPS be the only solution, or are you going to mandate the use of scrubbers on all vessels. So, what is your plan? If you try to lobby for your uh, for our support to give up OPS, do you have an overall blueprint to address the problem, Secretary? For this paper, this is about OPS at Kai Tak Cruise Terminal. Now, Mr. Chen would like to talk about Kowloon West and NT West. He would like to know about the overall picture. Now, Mr. Chairman, later on. We are going to have a comprehensive review of air pollution. That would be the best forum for us to follow up on ways to deal with the matter and come up with the new uh, data. Albert Chen, uh, other than ocean going vessels, uh, star ferries, or other vessels. Um, that are operating near to the shoreline as well as um, vessels from mainland. A lot of them are at birth throughout the night. So they have their own you know, um, equipment to generate electricity. So in the long run, should you not have OPS at all piers or terminals? You know, for vessels that are birthed overnight, you should really try to get them reduce the uh, emissions from the electricity generating process. Secretary, I don't have much confidence in your colleagues. Did you listen to our question? I can say that we adopt a very serious attitude in tackling air quality. Oh, we've heard Mr. Chan, your view. Well, I'm sure you know about our new regulations, and I do hope to consider various effective measures. Lately, we have uh, have exchanges with uh, northern European countries that use the new technology in uh, OPS. So, how can we apply that new technology into Hong Kong? Well, Secretary, can you? Do a comprehensive study. If you spend, you know, three hundred million dollars on the equipment, I really would rather you spend the money on uh, improving, you know, uh, pollution caused by vessels berthed around Hong Kong waters. You know, it's on on better spend the money on Star Ferry or China Hong Kong terminal than the KTCT. Well, for example, we have sludge vessels that actually travel from our switch driven plants to Tun Moon. So the such vessels are birthed. When we constructed the vessel, we uh, actually equipped it with the OPS capable system. Okay, last minute, Mr. In uh, 2013, Secretary, we uh, raised this in Lechco. The cruise terminal has a charter, and uh, more than 10 operators have joined that charter. Back then, we mentioned that those who were not willing to um, sign up for the charter, or you know, what are the reasons why some cruisers will not adopt OPS capable systems? I haven't heard from you the, the real reasons from you why the usage rate is so low. Whenever it comes to improving air quality, you know, we are willing to invest resources for that purpose. And yet, now you're saying that you want to change track, but do you have any alternatives? If you're not using this because your usage rate is so low, then would you have a more effective alternative option? I just asked your colleague whether you increase your spot checks because your, your random checks now are not effective. I can smell the odor more often than your colleagues. I'm so busy and I can still, you know, detect the problem and yet you are in this business and you have not done enough checks to find out the problem. I'm very dissatisfied. 
You have to tell us what is the alternative. Secretary, scrappers are scrappers、uh, feasible? Chairman, in the past we relied on a charter, you know, and to rely on participation by companies. And on July first, there will be a mandatory requirement, you know, asking all vessels to switch to a clean fuel to reduce、um, pollutants. Also, our team will also have a system of spot checks to complement the new regulation. We will conduct random checks. Would you enhance your random checks or increase manpower? Well, we are going to have a new whole new regulation in the whole of Asia, and we will deploy adequate staff to enforce the law. Okay, I think time's up for this、um, item. We will have to deal with the motion by Kenneth Chan now. I'm sure you have the wordings in front of you. Let me read it out to you before we take a vote.、Um, it says that the panel will urge the government to fulfill its pledge made in the policy address in 2013 to apply for funding from NACCO to install OPS at KTCT to improve air quality and protect public health. Vice Chairman, any supplement?、Um, well, health is、um, precious. In the past,、uh, various parties have supported the government's moves in improving air quality for the sake of public health. But the fact that the government suddenly called to halt this OPS plan, I'm very dissatisfied and find it very grateful. I hope that.、Um, Colleagues from various parties, you know, you did urge the government to、um, carry out a series of measures to improve quality in the past.、Uh, we should not let the government get away with it this time. That's why I put it down in our motion. Usage rate. Let me remind members,、uh, is just one excuse. Many public utilities have you have low usage rate. Are we saying that we should close the libraries of the libraries because not many people are going there? So I. Do hope that you will support this motion for the sake of public health, Secretary. Do you want to respond? Well, improving air quality is a serious,、uh, you know, target for us for this、um, administration, and we do have a whole, you know,、um, package of measures. The administration is not, you know, unwilling to、um, spend the money on it. We've spent, you know, more than ten billion dollars. Um, to actually improve air quality in another drive, it's not that we're being、uh, mindful with the money spent. As Mr. Wu said, we need to make sure that you know whatever measure that's adopted can really yield results. You know, in terms of improving air quality, so we need to look at the latest trends and see what are the best ways for us to achieve the goal. So, if you have to insist on something, or thinking back to several years ago, we need to we need to move ahead. We need to, you know, think、um, actually along, you know, or with consideration to the latest trends. We are open to future、um, communications. We have to make sure that we can make best use of our resources to improve air quality. That's our consistent stance. We just want to. Look more carefully, clearly at the options available、um, to be responsible and、uh, reasonable government. Okay, now let's put this motion to a vote. Who, whoever are in favor, please raise your hands. Four in favor. Those who are against. Okay. Those who are against, please raise your hands. Seven against. So. This motion has been rejected. Okay, now we've read up this item. Now, item five, report of the task force on external lighting. So I'll ask the administration、um, to come in, and I will ask the administration to take us through the paper first before questions、uh, can be raised by members. Please note that when we discuss this item, the Wen Chai District Council. On our、um, has written to us a letter on a plan to legislate against、uh, external、uh, light pollution, and on May 31st, after a meeting with the Wen Chai District Council,、um, a paper was submitted to this panel. So please note these two documents. Secretary, are you going to、uh, take us through the paper? Yes, Chairman and members.
We are here to brief members on the recommendations made by the Task Force on External Lighting in April. You know, the report uh, containing recommendations was submitted to the government back then. And I'm also going to tell you the government's responses to the recommendations. Let me thank uh, Albert. Albert Chow, Chairman, and the two working groups set up uh, and the conveners, uh, Simon Chung and Everett Lee, for attending um, the discussion today and uh, to brief members on the um, report. In 2011, the task force was set up to uh, consider the um, issue, and we have made reference to practices overseas before making recommendations on policies and strategies to the government. Now may I ask the Chairman of the Task Force, Dr. Albert Chow, to brief you the recommendations made by the Task Force. Dr. Chow, please be brief, because I'm sure members have read it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, members. Uh, Secretary, good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank the um, panel for giving us this chance to explain to you um, our report. In 2011, uh, the task force was set up by the administration to address the issue of a nuisance caused by light pollution. And we are also were also asked to um, do research on the practices overseas. In April this year, we submitted our report to the government. I will be very quick with our main recommendations and the work done. The task force had um, looked a lot at the regulating regimes overseas, um, indicators adopted, and we also went to areas like Wong Kok, Wen Cha, Yoma, Tejim Sachi, Tosway Bay, where there were uh, more or most complaints against light pollution. We considered, on the one hand, you know, external lighting and technical issues, uh, the preset times, um, the impact on decorative lighting and uh, you know, night view of Hong Kong. We also consider the negative impact of light pollution on people. In 2013, we carry out a stakeholder consultation. Uh, we also issued a paper on public engagement. And we consulted the public on the preset time and the uh, exemptions to be given to decorative lightings and also how to implement new regulations. There were 14 uh, forums in where we invited uh, various associations and district councils and interested parties to express to us their views. I think we had collected divergent views. On the whole, most agree that, you know, in uh, coming up with the uh, regulations, we should take into consideration take into consideration people's need for quality sleep at night and also to maintain Hong Kong's image as a uh, vibrant um, city. And most of the respondents were they supported uh, regulations to and for switching off of lights, they are concerned about the you know, impact on the business environment, safety, and also Hong Kong's image, you know, internationally when with all the lights are out at a certain time at night. And some respondents asked us to have uh, immediate legislation, or neither do uh, some uh, people consult to agree with mandatory um, regulations. So it seems that uh, stringent laws against external lighting, for example, statutory regulations uh, are something that the public are not yet ready for. And the um, consultations show, however, that uh, there is a need for other measures to reduce the nuisance caused by external lighting. We cannot do nothing. We have to act in some way, and we have to try to come up with ways to improve the situation. There are um, six points proposed. One is the charter scheme um, to be introduced on the voluntary scheme so that uh, any decorative lighting or signboards, advertising signboards or decorations would be put under control. Um, in the six, We hope that the government can launch a charter scheme within six months, and also we want to have uh, 
issue a guideline to encourage the public and private sectors to adopt good practices in the design, installation, and operation of external lighting installations. We hope that um, engineers, property developers, and users can also make reference to the guidelines. And we also want to um, promote the government to acknowledge good corporate citizens and also to have a public education and publicity campaign to raise public awareness of problems associated with external lighting. And we should also, uh, two years after the uh, Charter Scheme has been launched, the government should um, carry out further study to find out about the effectiveness of the multi pronged approach that we're proposing, you know, about two to three years after the Charter Scheme has been uh, put into practice. Should the review then show that there is adequate evidence to support legislation, then we should go ahead with legislation to control the uh, light pollution. And uh, the government will report to the ACE on the implementation of the administrative measures. And uh, we also want to see submission of record reports to the ACE so that we can minimize the nuisance caused by external lighting. Thank you, Dr. Cha. There are also two conveners um, uh, that, that is uh, conveners from the working group, two working groups, Mr. Chung and Mr. Li, uh, who are with us. So they are also here to answer questions. Now is the time for Q&A. Secretary, any supplement? I just want to make three points here. Firstly, we welcome and accept uh, the recommendations of the task force. We would like to reduce the nuisance of external lighting. We hope that in the second half of this year, we're able to launch a charter scheme. We will also like to have a, a ward scheme so that uh, we can reduce the relevant uh, nuisance. Um, we would like to report regularly to the ACE, and then we hope that we will be uh, assessing the effectiveness of the six prompt approach. And we hope that we are sort of um, having cooperation from the industry so that we can join hands to reduce the nuisance. Thank you. Uh, eight members would like to ask questions. I want to know if there are other members wishing to ask questions. Please raise your hands. Mr. Chen Kim Po, um, we are supposed to end by 10.30. I would like to extend it to no more than 10.45. I think probably there will be members wishing to ask a question in the second round, and there may be motions to be moved. Uh, Chung Shu Ken and then Frankie Yik. Uh, Secretary, would you like to make it clearer, two to three years? Even if you make us to wait for two years, it will be unacceptable. Now, if the guidelines are good, you don't need a charter. By having both, you are overlapping the efforts. It won't be able to, it is not going to work. If nobody is to become a signatory to the uh, charter, what are you going to do? Even if they sign the charter, if they don't switch off the lights, then it shows that it is a toothless tiger. Don't make us wait for two years, not to mention three years. Can you not have a midterm review after the yes time? If you find that it is not going to work, then please uh, draft a piece of legislation. Don't make us wait for two years, and then it, it will take you another two years to draft the bill. I just wonder whether you are very really sincere and wholehearted in trying to seek a solution. Now, for you to go after so many elaborate measures, you are only doing harm to the residents. Most of the neon light uh, signboards are unlawful. If they are unlawful, how would the owners uh, put down their names on your charter? Of course, they would just turn away and uh, refuse to acknowledge ownership. So is it possible to have a midterm review in a year's time, Secretary? I'll reply Mr. Chung's question succinctly, and then my colleagues can supplement. I think Mr. Chung has the same concern as ours. That is, we would like to work expeditiously to reduce the light nuisance. 
cost to the residents. But then it is a complicated issue. Even if we are to go down the legislative route, it takes time to gather the data. Now we are talking about a charter and guidelines. It means that it will afford us with a good opportunity to have a better grasp of the picture. So that eventually, even if we have to draft a bill, it will be a good one. We will be monitoring closely the progress. At the same time, we are going to carry out a survey to find out about the citizens' uh, reaction about the progress. So we need reasonable time to uh, work out the plan. We do promise that in the coming two to three years' time, uh, in due course, uh, we will be reporting back to you, including the ACG, as to whether there is the need for a midterm review. It isn't a matter of whether there will be a midterm review. In fact, there will be regular monitoring and regular reporting to the relevant organizations. Christopher Chung, you talked about two years. It's now in your paper, and yet here you talk about two to three years. So I'm not happy with such uncertainty. What about Causeway Bay and one child residents? They are really suffering. Can we not invite you and your committee members or task force members to go to spend a night in one child? See if you can get some sleep at all. Um, Mr. Lau, for the charter uh, that we're going to draw up, we have uh, made reference um, to the other charters, like one on the um, indoor air temperature of the shopping malls. Uh, we can see for ourselves that in the beginning, the uh, shop operators uh, had to w wait to get to to warm up. In the beginning, there were just about a hundred signatories. Last year, a thousand. By now, three thousand. So it takes time to warm up and have the um, publicity campaign gaining effectiveness. Frankie, yes, I can understand that uh, in some areas there are just too many uh, advertising signs. So we need to be focused in our efforts. Now, the task force has told us that. Because of the divergence of views, it's better to have a charter and then just see what happens uh, in the coming two years. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, the Secretary should understand that uh, we can learn from the successful experience of the charter for switch of fuel at birth in the shipping industry. Mr. Tommy Chung in the past had already told you about our party position. We do have queries about uh, immediate legislation. I agree with the proposals in the paper. I thank Mr. Yik for his comments. Well, um, working through a charter scheme would be the um, quickest way to go about it, and therefore we are now working actively on it. We hope we can come up with a charter scheme in the nearest um, future, and then we can bring about some improvements. In fact, we have a very uh, positive attitude here. Mr. Yik, finished. Ms. Sit Hall, I'm grossly disappointed. For the so-called six-pronged approach, a lot of them have been tried in the past. Public education. Well, in fact, uh, the idea came from the public. So the public is educating the government. For the request to regulate external lighting, I think um, the calls have been very strong. Um, before the task force was set up in 2011, the guidelines were already there, and yet nobody would like to follow the guidelines. Now, four years have already passed. Your recommendation is still having a charter scheme, and you ask us to wait for another two years. So, in other words, it takes it has taken 10 years to see any control on external lighting. That's why for democracy, it will certainly have to take more than 30 years. Now, for the grassroots, I think they are more affected. 
they are from the most disadvantaged group. They uh, have menial uh, work. They can't afford to live in better places. They live in Yaochimong, Causeway Bay, where you have both commercial and residential developments. They need sleep to go back to their manual work the following day. Now, you are trying to dismiss the ideas on different accusers. Now, we have got huge size signboards. Um, and in fact, when you walk under such um, huge signboards, you feel that you are being scorched under the sun. Now, you try to dismiss our concerns by saying that uh, there are security and safety reasons. Can you not try to regulate the outrageous uh, cases first? Now you say that two years later, and then you try to see whether there is full justification. In fact, um, you have got guidelines, but then they are not being followed. So that's the rationale, that's the justification of having legislation. So, Secretary, I will leave you with one minute to answer my question. Can you not introduce legislation so as to deal with the most outrageous uh, outdoor signboards? Um, they they have got nothing to do with safety or uh, security. So ask them to switch off by 11. Can you do it? Mr. Chairman, I can appreciate what Ms. Ho is saying. I've been to Causeway Bay and Yao Chim Wong and Wan Chai. Uh, I went there recently. I don't know whether Miss Ho has been there. Of course, I've been there because that's my constituency. Uh, we went there personally at 11 or 12 to see for ourselves uh, what they looked like. So, to a certain extent, I think uh, we have seen some improvements, but of course, uh, new signs, new signboards may crop up, and then there will be new areas of concern. Now, for the task force, I think the task force has taken um, the job very seriously, and there hasn't been any consensus in the community. The spectrum of views is very wide. Some would like to have legislation immediately, while others would even object to a charter scheme. So different views uh, are found in the community. Yes, we agree that uh, the grassroots are the most affected. But then what is the most effective way to go about it? I think a charter scheme will afford instant uh, improvements. Sorry, your time is up. Today, we have got many members wishing to ask questions. Next, Mr. Vincent Fang, you know that I'm from the retail and wholesale sector. I agree with the paper from the Task Force on External Lighting. We have had many charters with the government, in some cases entirely voluntarily. Say, for example, during the financial crisis, uh, we signed a charter to say that we would not be dismissing our employees. We did so not because of pressure from anybody. So if there's a cause for us to put down our signatures to a charter, we will be more than happy to do so on our own. I disagree with Sid Hall. A legislative process will take several years to complete. Now, for the freshy or the flashing lights, I think they should be regulated immediately. So if the government can talk to the chambers of commerce, if you can talk to the shop operators, in particular those related to the large size signboards, I'm sure they will adopt your proposal immediately. It means that that's quicker than legislation. If we start to legislate over everything, it will tarnish our image. We can't attract to foreign investors, our economy is going downhill, so I think it is going to cause harm to us. And then, um, 
maybe recently the government is trying to switch off some of the street lights, but then we do lighting for safety and security and operational purposes. I'm afraid by switching off the lights unnecessarily, um, there has been an increase in the crime rate. So please go around and see if there are uh, signboards that are outrageous. Uh, so you can go to such commercial buildings. You can contact the commercial um, tenants uh, directly. They are not unreasonable. So um, have the charter scheme first and try to see if they're going to exercise self-control. If they can, then I think it's better than legislation. That's much quicker. Secretary, I'd like to thank Mr. Fang for his uh, comments. Well, um, we would like to adopt the quickest and most uh, effective way to solve the problem. Of course, we do not rule out the legislative route, but then we are concerned and we want to uh, get effects uh, in the quickest way. And therefore, we would like to cooperate with the uh, operators and then we reduce the uh, light nuisance. So it is a common aspiration. I hope Mr. Fang will help us in launching the charter scheme. Initially, uh, the response from the operators um, has been uh, positive and we'll be monitoring the uh, outcome. So if it is a it is very different from our expectation, then we have to reconsider the case. Mr. Fang. Do you have a list of the worst nuisance cases? Uh, if you have got such a list, would you like to start with them? Secretary, we understand that there are various districts that particularly uh, concern like Yao Chi Mong or Cosmay Bay. We will look at the situation there and um, find to find the right solution for it. Um, just then three members have asked to speak. If we allow them, allow them to speak, then it will be beyond 10.30. So I think for the last three members, Helena Wong, Yu Su Wing, and Chen Hongpan, each one of you will only have three minutes. Leung Kai Chung. Thank you, Chairman. You said, well, you had this six uh, proposals. I have no objection to the six proposals as to how effective they will be. Well, depends. But the report by the task force has got some good content, even though the secretary said uh, there are divergent views in the society and uh, there could be difficulties in enforcement. And you also studied experiences in um, countries of around the world that there, haven't, there are not that much reference materials. But even with the six proposals, you can go ahead with them and yet you can legislate at the same time. Since you said that this is such a complicated topic, I know it seems complicated, but you can um, carry out the uh, proposals in stages. The first stage may be uh, to legislate. In paragraph 41, you don't need to answer me. I'll just use all my four minutes. You said for decorative lighting and static, um, um, you know, flashing signboards or video wars. For these, why don't you let have legislation Appoint them first, or you can just legislate uh, against uh, video walls first. For, you know, video walls on the exterior of buildings first. At least then you will have a piece of legislation available. If you start the legislative process now, you can um, tackle it in five stages. You can act first. Then the public can see that you are determined to solve this issue. Even though there are a lot of technical problems concerned and there's no consensus on them, at least we can see that at least um, the proposal with the most consensus can be acted upon. And then after you've carried out these six proposals, you can make changes to legislation a couple of years from now. Why don't you legislate, Secretary? Thank you, Mr. Le, for your answers. We'll walk on both feet. Uh, first, on the one hand, we'll uh, rely on the charter scheme for the static lightings or video walls. If we can solve the issue through the charter scheme, then the public may think, well, that's uh, acceptable. And 
And if we can, you know, we can also find time to collect relevant information and to plan for um, the right piece of legislation to take, tackle any outstanding issues. That's why we are working on both feet now. Maybe the charter scheme could actually achieve the same purpose as um, what legislation can do, because you know, there are resources involved in um, legislating. Mr. Lau, well, I'm not quite satisfied with this explanation. You know that the charter scheme or guidelines have no binding effects. I'm talking about, uh, I'm not talking about particular districts, but there are video walls on the exterior of buildings. You may ask them to switch off the light at midnight. That's something very simple, very simple legislation. How to enforce it is easy. What do you mean by video walls? Uh, we all know we have a consensus on what video walls are, how big they are. If you ask me to legislate, I can draft a law for you in one week. There's no need to, for any resources. I can do it for you. Private members bill. Very well. That can be done. So, Secretary, are you not going? I really can't accept your legislation. Please put it on record. Next one, Albert Chan. First of all, let me thank uh, Dr. Chow and the uh, members of the task force for your work. I personally think that we need to strike a balance. You know, it's not easy under the current framework. Basically, you know, Hong Kong today, um, the business and industrial sectors have all the say. Well, they can even kill people with the excuse of, uh, you know, um, keeping the economy sound. Light pollution is actually similar to cancer. It's not just a kind of torture. It also really make the people affected want to take their lives. Some you know, shop owners have conscience. I wrote to uh, some um, gold shops in Chungon Street to ask them to uh, improve the lighting situation, to reduce the external lighting. You know, because some residents have to install very thick curtains to shield um, the light, the intense lighting. But I think at this time we can do something to ease the situation. First of all, by calling on the um, sources or um, operators to reduce the intensity of light. And also, I live in the new territories. I always found that some of the lightings in the villages are just a few feet away from the um, from where people live. Just like ten or eight feet away from people's homes, so the government itself has generated light pollution. Some people even cut off the electricity supply to stop the lighting because the street lights are just too close to people's homes. I've raised concern about this issue for many years. Street lights. I use this example many times in Yatung Estate. Uh, on the footbridge leading to Mawan village, every few feet you see a street light. So it's very bright there. Do you understand the public may think that the brighter it might be, but there's a standard for you know the extent to which you go um, to have safety. The I think you can monitor the government's behavior. We talk about you know. Uh, Plastic bag, uh, plastic bags. You ask people to pay enough for plastic bags, and yet, yeah, the government itself actually use uh, large black plastic bags to cover, you know, grasses that you've cut out from trees on the streets. I think you need to have a balance here. The government should take the lead in uh, reducing light pollution. Secretary, just as I asked to lead in not using plastic bags, when it comes to legislation, I hope that there could be some criteria laid down. But it's nonsense to say that signboards, you know, help the economy. Look at Paris. Look at any big metropolis around the world. Beautiful cities. Where would you find large, you know, signboards? That's nonsense. The claim made, you know, uh, in defense of signboards are just nonsense. You need, we need to correct that thinking. 
How can you have signboards that actually are not environmental and also affect or cause nuisance to the public? Um, you know, residential and business districts are different. I mean, you you can indeed impose a ban on uh, signboards in some areas. In in some you know shopping areas, the signboards are huge. So you need to um, have regulations banning the uh, installation of large signage in residential areas. You, you can regulate or impose control on the size, intensity, the brightness of lighting in some areas, residential areas. Okay, next one. When I was small, um, signboard signages are static. You know, in Hong Kong, they're all static. When you went overseas, you saw some non-static sideboards, and you asked the adults, "Why is it that in Hong Kong we we didn't have any uh, non-static signs?" Well, and the adults were told us that well because uh, the non-static boards are under control. Then, but as society progressed and as new technology arose, now we've seen more and more non-static signage. Video walls, you know, outdoor video video displays. I really think we should be more concerned about them. It's not just about light pollution, but noise pollution as well. Because uh, there are broadcasts outdoors, you know, broadcasting adverts, or even some uh, clippings from um, movies. Are you? Tackling the issue from perspective of uh, light pollution alone, or are you concerned about the uh, you know audio you know video audio video um, installations in public areas? Are you concerned about, or, or are you thinking of having control over noise pollution cost? Now, your proposal of the charter scheme, you know, as a way to control external lighting, I agree with it. During the consultation process, we heard a number a number of views from the sector who were concerned that you know some signboards need to be on for a longer period of time in busy areas, for example, signboards of uh, night spots. But of course, you know, from the op um, from the perspective of running a business, you know, under different circumstances. You know, uh, you know the board, so the lighting could be switched off at different periods of time. But for my recollection is uh, most shop owners or business owners do not disagree with the need for environmental protection. But if you make it compulsory or to have uh, compulsory legislation, these uh, business operators would be largely worried, and they will also want to. Um, you know, actually um, consider what impact it will have on their business. So legislation could be quite complicated. It's not what you mean. It's not easy, as you said, to have legislation in one week's time. I'm not doubting the ability of my colleagues, but it's not just about cost. We need to look at the practical implications as well. So I hope that we can join hands in trying to use the charter scheme to um, sort out the situation. Just then a few members have expressed their views. They have asked the government to set a timetable for a review. And yet the secretary has said that it will be an ongoing uh, there will be an ongoing review and see what can be done or what sorts of legislation or control should be imposed. I agree. So, can you explain to us, Secretary, about the uh, noise pollution? Secretary, as permanent secretary. Okay, as for the static, uh, non-static uh, installations or video walls, I know that the uh, non-static lighting has posed the most nuisance. So, it, when the uh, charter scheme is up and running, we propose that in some districts, even when the uh, shop owners want it. Sorry, I'm not just talking about. Talking about lighting, I'm talking about noise pollution. Sorry, your time's up. Next one. In the past, Lechco 
would uh, you know meet with um, district councillors, and I'm sure Lechko had met from, for example, councillors from Wen Chai about the concern uh, of the nuisance caused by external lighting. And the councillors have told us they're heavily disgusted with uh, these uh, you know external lighting, and the guidelines and charter scheme are unlikely to have much effects. So since 2011 till now, the task force is still talking about guidelines and charter scheme. So it seems that you are not really addressing the um, requests and demands of LACHCO members and Wen Chai district councillors. And neither have you um, actually paid attention to the feelings of affected residents. Secretary, you said you have been to the districts. Have you been to like a, a just a, an area or to a household? It's like, you know, if you go to like a place like visiting a zoo, then it's different from you know visiting people who are affected day and night, you know by the pollution. You said you understood, but it seems like you're not really doing much. You know it it cannot convince me that you are really determined to tackle the issue. Apart from charter scheme in the guidelines, you say that. Uh, you talk about publicity, you know, and uh, awards, giving awards. But now we're asking the government to control the situation. What's the point of giving them stickers or awards? You know, getting stickers would not mean more business for a shop owner. So what incentives do you have to get the business owners to comply? I mean, I don't see why the business owners would like to get you know awards from you. So you have studied this issue for four years, and now you're still telling me about implementing a charter scheme for two more years. So for residents who are waiting for assistance, you know, rest, a resolution from you, they would be very, totally, you know, very angry with the government. Of course, colleagues have also said that uh, for the charter to be launched, uh, you want uh, after the charter scheme has been launched, uh, you want to um, carry out your review. Uh, it is said that um, you should come back in a year's time in instead of two. There is also a suggestion that you should work on those um, uh, very uh, serious uh, cases of nuisance. And then for the charter and the guidelines to be effective, I hope you can set up a hotline and you should have dedicated officers to handle the complaints. Once you receive a complaint, you should talk to the shop operators. As Mr. Fang has suggested, he can also enlist the help of Mr. Fang. Uh, if you are able to handle the complaint, uh, so be it. If not, then you need to justify why you can't. You, you can't just have a talk shop uh, for a charter scheme unless you are you, you must be a willing party before you put down your signature to the charter. So I hope that um, the government can give us uh, specific uh, measures. Secretary, I thank Mr. Kwok for um, his comments. The charter is going to be something new. In other words, it is going to be an enhanced measure to help the residents. And Mr. Kwok has suggested that there should be closer liaison. And we have heard Mr. Kwok's view that we should uh, step up the liaison. Dr. Wong, for the Charter, for the government to resort to such a means, I think the government is simply trying to store its feet to legislate. You lack the will to govern. Now, by having legislation, it means that we are empowering the government to enforce the law. Now, you have um, written down something that we want you to do, but then it is voluntary in nature if one participates in the charter scheme. And in fact, for paragraph 27, you have said that you need to be more liberal in order to attract more participants. Please tell us the benchmark or the threshold 
to help you to decide on the way forward. That is, uh, what would be the criteria for you to base your decision on legislating. If the charter scheme is not well received, you don't attract many participants, and if they don't switch off their lights by 11 p.m., though they have pledged. So what is your criteria? Number of participants, compliance rate, or what? Does it mean that whenever there is a breach, you're going to have a demerit point? And um, would it be applied across the board? And what are the criteria for you to base your decision to legislate? If you don't have such criteria, then it is meaningless. There is also one um, serious omission uh, for ICC on top of the current station. For this kind of buildings, well, the glass walls are reflecting the light. So it is a nuisance. Um, even during daytime, you have to put on your sunglasses and you have to draw your curtains because the glass curtains or the glass panels are reflecting the sunlight. And even for Silver C1 residents, they're being affected. And even for drivers coming down Route 3, the glare is also hurting the eyes of the motorists. So how come that your guidelines do not cover anything on new buildings? I think there should be a DIA on light nuisance. That is, you should discourage or you should even ban the use of such materials. If you don't go down the legislative route, then you can't do anything about it. Please note her proposal. Mr. Yu Si Wing, we are the Pearl of the Orient because of the spectacular night scene. Now, if we darken both sides of the harbour by 11, and if the street lighting is removed, I just wonder if tourists are interested in coming here to spend money, and even locals will lose their interest to go out. So don't just look at the local aspirations. You have to take Hong Kong's uh, business sector uh, as a whole into consideration. If somebody lives in the inner street, if we have got many signboards around me day and night, of course it will be a nuisance. But then if you legislate and if you adopt a broad brush approach, it is a dangerous precedent and it it will be difficult to revise the law once it is introduced. So I opt for a charter scheme so that we can adopt a tailor-made solution. Like in a particular area, we don't need such a large sign. We don't need it to be lit for so long a time, so late into the night. Then something can be done about it. But then from Chim Sa Chui East, the Central and Causeway Bay for signs facing the harbour. If they are switched off by 11, but then it would be the time for people to go out to enjoy this spectacular night scene. And that means we're going to lose the reputation as the Orient as the Pearl of the Orient. So it's better to rely on the guidelines and the charter scheme. If the industry can exercise self-discipline and self-control, then we can have a win-win situation. Some members are very impatient. They want to have legislation. I don't think this is necessary. We can have regular reviews so that we will be told about the improvements um, and where we can uh, sort of um, step up um, the requirements. Secretary, well, I think Mr. Yu has got a similar view as that of our task force. That is, uh, we should uh, have a gradual approach. As we all know that it is a complex issue. Uh, yes, the community is concerned. I agree with Mr. Yu. That is, we should be watching it regularly, and we should have more liaison with the industry. We should make good use of the charter scheme. Mr. Yu, I agree that there's no need for a timetable. Your view is clear. 
two members would like to speak and yet they are not here. All others who have indicated they wish to speak have all spoken. I suggest that we end this uh, uh, this topic. I would like to thank Mr. Wong as well as the two conveners of the working group, AOB. Nothing under AOB. Meeting adjourned. Meeting adjourned.